Hello and welcome everyone. If there's something positive we've learned over this last crazy year, it's that we can hire and work with the best people for the job no matter where they live. That means our talent can be happier working from the location that makes them most productive. And especially for sales representatives like we're talking about today, intrinsic motivation is crucial. It's doubly important when you're looking to expand your tech company to new markets. Another thing we learned in 2020 is the need for flexibility. Right now in the tech, the tech industry is doing for the most part better than ever. We're actually the solutions to a lot of the issues right now that's facing humanity and supporting some of the other ones. So that's great. And while we believe it's time for you to branch out to new markets and it's a great time for tech companies to go abroad and companies in general, it doesn't mean you should burden yourself with the cost of building a European headquarters when you might not be able to go even there or taking on arduous, complicated European employment contracts. Today, we're talking with two specialists about how hiring that perfect employee, you know, how to do that while maybe it's from a Zoom room interview and then about how to onboard them. And then how to scale to build a world-class European sales team when you probably won't be able to fly to that new market, at least for the first half of this year. And if we have enough time, we're going to get into some of the idiosyncrasies of various European markets and some challenges old and new <coughs> Brexit. <laughs> There's plenty to talk about in this topic and we won't get to everything, but we want to prioritize your questions. Uh, audience members that are listening live, welcome. Of course, welcome to those listening after the recording too. But those listening live, of course, you get the benefit of taking advantage of the Bright Talk platform to ask our guests what you want to learn about. So go on now. Uh, it's a good way to test that audio is working anyway. But if you can go ahead and plug into the chat um, in the form of a question, it doesn't have to be, but it says questions, but into the chat where you're calling from in the world and what you hope to get out of listening to this conversation. So yeah, I really welcome everyone on the call. And I'm your host, Jennifer Riggins. In this episode of FYI, Finding Your Influence, we are talking to Diane Albano, the CRO of Globalization Partners, and Rick Pizzoli, founder and CEO of Salesforce Europe, who is also, just caveat, one of my clients. Make sure to listen to our last episode when Rick was first on with Interlinks Alan Mockridge, where we talk about how to optimize your remote sales in Europe and Asia. So why don't we kick off while we're waiting for the audience to give us some awesome feedback. And if you can both introduce yourselves and tell the audience really briefly about your background and then share just a little bit about how your organizations specifically help companies capture the best international talent no matter where they live. So Diane, can you please start? Welcome. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm really happy to be here. I, as said, um, my name is Diane Albano and I'm from Globalization Partners. A lot of you may have or may not have heard about Globalization Partners. We were formed as a company nine years ago by our founder, Nicole Sahin, who had this great idea that we could help companies expand globally, hire anyone, anywhere without the hassle um, and without all the complication of setting up an entity in a country. So she went ahead starting in 2012 and set up entities in now nearly 75 countries where we can hire people on behalf of the companies that want to expand globally. My role at Globalization Partners is the chief revenue officer. I'm responsible for all sales and marketing and all partner network type relationships across the world. What we've been doing for the last, let's say seven years is focusing on the US market and the companies that, <clears throat> excuse me, wanted to go outside the US. And now in 2020, we opened offices in both EMEA and Asia for servicing companies that are in those jurisdictions that want to move anywhere in the world. So we really help companies to do that quickly, efficiently, and compliantly. And of course, we'll talk a lot about that as we get going into this presentation. My background has been over the last uh, 30 plus years, building teams globally, 
working internationally, really understanding the different markets and helping the companies that I've been typically the chief revenue officer for finding places where we want to do business outside of in the case, in my case, anyways, in the U.S. country. So I'm um, really excited to talk to all of you and looking forward to your questions because Rick and I, I'll speak on behalf of REC2, we would love to answer your questions as we go along and make this more conversational. Now over to you, Rick. Thank you, Diane. Uh, that was a, a great start. And thank everybody for joining. My name is Rick Pizzoli. I'm the founder and CEO of Salesforce Europe. Um, I'm originally from San Francisco. I moved out to Europe about 25 years ago. I can't believe it. It's almost half of my life. Um, I first moved out opening Europe for a few tech companies, doing it the tra traditional way of opening up offices and hiring and firing people. Realized how much of a challenge that is. And so in 2003, I founded Salesforce Europe to really add speed and intelligence to the whole market entry process. Uh, since then, we've helped about 300 technology companies expand to Europe. Um, we have about 100 sales personnel on our team today, supporting about 40 active clients. Um, our services, we, we start our clients with um, sales consulting and helping them kind of define what their sales strategy is for Europe, um, where they're going to go, what countries, what kind of services that they need. Um, and then we propose a set of our services as a, as a managed service. And those services include lead generation, inside sales, and field sales. And per the question of Jennifer of how companies can capture, how we help companies capture the best international talent, really we, we do that by first helping them define um, what kind of talent they need. What is their sales strategy? Because you could have some of the best talent, but if it's the wrong profile in the wrong market and they're not supported well, you're not going to be successful. So we do a lot of work with our clients up front to define what that sales strategy is, how we can replicate their success in their home market, whether it's uh, in, from Europe, to Europe, so Spain to Europe or the US to Europe, what made you successful in your home market? How do we replicate that in the new market? How do we build a team around that in the new market? And then how do we leverage the current team that we have today and new people if we need to bring them on to build that, that world-class team to help you be successful in Europe? And we're gonna talk about some of those details today. So thank you. It's obvious you both have a lot in common because you're in an interesting perspective that both of the services your companies offer are helping companies move abroad. But then on the other hand, you've definitely helped your own company and of course other companies grow abroad and expand. So you totally have the experience I think a lot of our listeners seem to be looking for as they want to understand more about sales in Europe as we heard, we saw in the chat. Also, it sounds like you're in interesting positions, especially because your services, outsourcing, et cetera, um, where, you know, you're, you've had a, as awkward and weird, we've all had not a great 2020 year, you, your companies are presented as strong solutions in 2020 and now in, gosh, we are one month into 2021. So there's lots to look forward to. And I think we're excited to talk about how to expand. So, it, but I guess all companies, especially a company like at that cusp doing successful in their home country, and they're thinking about, okay, is it time to go global? Are we, are we ready? But obviously there's a risk in that. There's a lot of money that goes into this expansion. So before you go global, you need to get feel for the right time to expand. So Rick, how you can go first, how can sales leaders identify that it's the right time to start building sales teams in other countries? Thank you, Jennifer. Um, well, timing is, is important. Um, you, you, obviously, you don't want to go too early before you're, before you're prepared or, or too late when your competition may already have a you know, step up in, in the new markets. So we advise our clients to first um, to start thinking about going when you're really well established in your home market. So you have happy um, paying clients um, that you've kind of made that transition from a startup where you're testing multiple verticals where maybe you've sold, you have 20 current clients and out of those 20 clients, 10 are in one vertical and maybe another four, you know, another uh, 10 are in four or five different verticals. You've defined, okay, those 10 are the verticals that I want to focus on or the vertical I want to focus on. And in your international expansion, you should really be thinking about that focused vertical 
in building your team around that that, per, that vertical because you can't build a team to sell to everybody. So if, if you're selling to telco and you're selling to banks and you're selling to retail, but telco is where you have had your, your best success in your home market, then build your international team around that telco market and, and really hit that hard and then expand from there. Um, the next thing you should look at is uh, is uh, um, looking at your your sales structure and your metrics in your home market. Um, how are you building your pipeline today? How much is coming from digital marketing and inbound? How much is coming from outbound lead generation? Um, and what those metrics are from uh, lead generation to marketing qualified leads. So lead generation contacts to marketing qualified leads to sales qualified leads to opportunities to, to deals. Um, a company should be mature enough to, to understand what that is um, put numbers behind um, behind it. So if you want, if you're getting a million in revenue, then your pipeline is probably four million. And how many leads do you need to get to be able to get that pipeline? And then when you look to Europe, um, be realistic, saying, okay, well, if we want a million in revenue in Europe, then we need to replicate the same kind of model, the same kind of pipeline, same kind of digital marketing for inbound, the same kind of lead generation for for outbound. Um, the same or similar lead gen, uh, similar uh, inside sales model and similar field sales model. Um, and, and when we have that clear clarity from our clients, we can then build those teams um, um, pre pretty quickly in Europe. Um, and then lastly, having the, the budget and resources to support growth. Uh, it takes time to, to launch in a new market, in a new region, especially if you're not an unknown brand. Um, first, you need to build a brand about your own company, becoming known as a is a credible partner to 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 new companies um, and having uh, good technology that they want to buy. So so that can take anywhere from kind of a short sales cycle of four months to typically more six to eight to twelve months to really establish yourself in a new market. And so that takes budget and resources to support the international expansion team. It totally makes sense that you really have to reflect on where you are before you can go anywhere else. I guess should have thought of that before I moved abroad on a whim, but it's worked out for me uh, over the last 12 years. Uh, Diane, same question. And how do you know that it's a good idea? Like you're not only your company is ready, but why would you want to move abroad? You know, there are, there are so many answers to this. And I, and I have to say, Rick, I concur with everything that you said. For me, a couple couple things that I would point to one is companies need to have the appetite for growth. So numerous companies that I work for started in, again, I'm from the U.S., in the U.S., and said, we want to grow. How do we grow? And so they look at different markets. And typically, uh, like you asked, Remus, on uh, your, you want to understand more about the U.K. From a U.S. perspective, we always did look to what's the easiest country that we can get into first. We English speaking, know the language, don't have to worry about localization as much. And in numerous companies over the last 20 years, we've moved into the UK first. Um, that's kind of a, an easy way to start, but it does rely on data and the point that Rick made regarding what's the demand. So a lot of times in US companies, when it comes to lead generation, you'll see a lot of leads coming in because you're purposefully going after them in a particular geography. As soon as you broaden that and start to look at digital marketing from an international standpoint, you hone in on certain countries and you look to see if the keywords are resonating in that particular country or countries. And so as you're doing that and gathering that market data, you will come up with some conclusions that, wow, there is a market for what it is that I'm selling. There is a market that we should now think about putting some feet on the street, feet on the ground, maybe start to have one or two salespeople, whatever that model happens to be. So even in the company that I'm with, when I was getting hired, the CEO said, we want to go, we want to go outside the US, we want to grow internationally. So the first thing I did was hire someone in the UK and then decide where do we want to set up European headquarters which is Galway, where do I want to hire most of the salespeople, BDRs, marketing folks, UK, Galway, and now we're broadening into the Netherlands, France, Israel, Middle East, um, multiple different countries, Germany. 
So again, you know, the big thing is where are the opportunities? How can you identify them? Why do you want to be there? I want to grow. Um, there's a market for what I have to sell. The other big phenomenon that we're seeing now with COVID and why companies like ours grew at such a big rate last year is because now we can hire talent anywhere. And so if you want to hire the best C CFO and you found that person in Germany and you're a UK-based company, you can do that pretty easily. And I'll, I'll talk about our company and why we make it easy in a bit. But at the end of the day, if we can hire talent anywhere, as well as grow internationally to grow our bottom line from a company standpoint, and certainly our customer standpoint, that's really what, what companies want to do. Diversification of revenue is important. You can't rely on just one market. So just being in the US for us was out of the question. The companies that we have over a thousand customers, they were pre predominantly 90% out of the US, but what were they doing? They were growing thousands of people outside the US and going all over the world in Southeast Asia, Asia, all over Europe, Latin America, et cetera. So being able to uh, understand the markets that you wanna be in and doing the market research behind all of that is really the backbone of success. So that's in a nutshell, but we'll get into a lot more of the details as we get into the talk here. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you Thank both. You. First and foremost to acknowledge uh, the questions here. If we can go on mute while we're not talking, it'd be great. I'm feeling hearing some background music. I just wanted to, someone said great conversation. Thanks, I think they are doing great too. So thank you. Um, and are we showing video? No, we're not. It's a new part of the Bright Talk platforms. So we weren't really sure about it yet, but also let's be serious. After all these, this year, we're all on Zoom burnout. So it's nice to just have a conversation <laughs> and also to give y'all that listeners the time to, you know, do other stuff while you're listening to this, like a podcast walk around, move around the house if you want to while listening to this. It's a good way to learn is when you're actively doing something else. Like, let's be honest, our, either our houses are a lot cleaner or a lot dirtier right now because it's a good procrastination tool. So please do keep your questions coming in um, and we will do our best to answer them in the next 40 or so minutes. So next up, Diane, why don't you start by, you because you've done this before and you've you've alluded to that you often start with London, but how do you, what type of market research do you do and how do you find that product market fit in an international market that when maybe you haven't been there, you certainly can't go there right now. Sure. So again, you know, market research is really important. Um, we rely on it heavily and we actually have a team of about 10 people in India who do a lot of our market research and help us with understanding markets to get into. So when we looked at about a year and a half ago when I started, when we looked at where do we want to go, we found that the Mecca for the biggest amount of demand initially would be the UK. So that's why we went into the UK. But for some companies, it could be Singapore, it could be China, it could be Japan, it could be Spain, it could be anywhere. But getting some of that market research to see where the products and services res resonate is a really important first step. Or as I said, and Rick said it too, if we start to see demand, because leads will come in, people will find you, whether or not you're targeting a market. And all of a sudden, if you have an influx of leads from a particular country, that may be one worth looking at and one worth investing in. And so looking at, um, yes, we want to set up a big, and a big um, set of people in Taiwan, or we want to set up a group of developers in Poland, whatever it happens to be. Uh, those are the types of things that you kind of look at as you're initially spreading your wings and going outside your, your home country. Being able to do a SWOT analysis and, and really saying what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats in those particular markets is also a way to just do the due diligence behind that maybe feeling that you have so that it's really data driven. It's very important to be data driven. And then sometimes there are markets that you just have, you do have a feeling. You say, you know what? I think this is going to play in Latin America. I want to get into Brazil. This is a service that really will benefit the, that country or that set of 
companies that are in Brazil. And so you look to expansion there. But that's essentially it. I think I answered a little bit of this question in the first question too. So thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's definitely a, everyone thinks of London first, which does have its benefits, but also we have to know that not all country and not all companies on the call are American or British companies. So maybe if they're a Portuguese company, they want to target Brazil or a, a Latin American company wants to target Spain. It could be all over even language can be a barrier, but can also be an inspiration to where to go. And also exactly. don't people have teammates or they want to recruit, maybe they do it backwards and they find the perfect teammate and they're like, that's enough to want to start the business there. And that's the dream, I guess, to be that employee, right? All so, right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so Rick, how do you help advise people on which country to enter first? Do they usually know? Do they want help in finding that? How do they usually decide? Rick, you may be on mute. Sorry, yeah, you told me to go on mute, mute and now I'm, now I went on mute. <laughs> that is uh, especially 2020, that's okay, you're on mute. That's right, that's right, thank you. Thank you. I would've just kept on talking. Um, so so yeah, thank you, Diane, on the question of, of the UK because it, it, it does always come up and, and most US companies do ask for the UK first and, and most European companies ask for the UK first, but both sides really look to the UK as kind of a, um, a stepping stone for their growth. Um, you know, US, it's one hour closer as far as time zone, it's English friendly. Most people know London, they're comfortable there. Um, and then use that as the hub to, to move to Europe. And, and that's great for most companies, it still works fine. Um, and European companies look for the same. They say, well, I can start in London. Um, I might be a Spanish company or French or German. Um, I speak English, so that's the next natural step. And then from there I can go to Europe and from there eventually I can go to the US. And, and that's great, especially if you're using it as an international hub like Globalization Partners is, and there's a lot of international companies there. So it's great from, for your sales. Um, but we also have to think about it's it's because everybody's going there first, you might have three competitors in your home market, let's say the US. And if you're a Spanish company, you might have three European competitors. All six might be in, in the UK, in London. So if you're calling on London banks or retail or at whatever it is, uh, it might be the most competitive city in the entire world for your services. And so London is not always the, the best place to start. So it, it is important to think before you jump um, and, and, and do a little bit of research. And that can be using a third party research company. Um, there's some great companies in, in India and around that can do that market research. Um, we do some uh, market research for our clients as well. But we, we typically start by really asking them to do an internal analysis of what they're uh, seeing in the market. So where are they getting leads from, from the market? Do they have current clients in Europe? And if so, where do they have those current clients? And are those good, healthy clients? Are they well-paying clients? What, what verticals are they coming from? Um, where are the leads coming from? And do an analysis of those leads. And so um, what are your conversion rates of leads in the US compared to leads in Europe? And then within Europe, what are your conversion rates of, of leads from France, Germany, Spain, Italy? And, and do an analysis of why you're winning those and why you're not. Um, and, and maybe one of the reasons you're not is just not having a local presence, possibly in the UK, or local presence plus local language in, in, in France, Germany, Spain, Italy, other markets where, where, where having a local language and local presence is really going to help the process. Um, so we help ask our clients to do that analysis. We do it with them. Look at the current clients. Look at the leads. Look at that close ratio. Um, we also ask them to look at their competition. Um, so their main competition in the US and Europe where are they today and where do they have offices and where do they have clients if, if they can find that. Um, look at the, the language capabilities of the company. Do they have products only in English or are their products been localized and do they have sales and marketing tools in, in other languages as well? If, if everything is only in English or they're in their, let's say English and French or English, um, American English um, going to Europe or let's say a Spanish company having Spanish and, and English then you are going to be limited to English-friendly countries, which are going to be the UK, Ireland, Benelux, and the Nordics. Um, so maybe if you don't need to be in London, maybe the Nordics or the Benelux are the best market to start in to get that first foothold to, to prove the market because you don't want to start in a market like the UK and find that it's so 
competitive that you don't have a successful experience um, and then you have to pull out or you as the CRO or the VP of Europe lose your job because the, the job was, wasn't well done. So, so that's an important to do the analysis before you go in, look at regulatory issues. Is there anything from a regulatory perspective that's going to limit you or, or support one market or another? So if, if you're selling hardware today, um, UK might not be the best market because if you're landing there and you're going to be selling hardware from the UK to the rest of Europe, then you might be hit with some, some new taxes with, with Brexit. From a software and SaaS perspective, we have not seen any impact. So, um, so uh, the startups or SaaS companies that are, that are either coming from London or moving or looking to land in London, we, have, we don't see that, that they've been impacted by Brexit. Um, and then we ask our clients to, then when we work with our clients to pri prioritize those markets um, and, and choose maybe three or four to test. Um, and we can test by uh, doing some um, managed lead generation or inside sales or field sales activities into those markets, see what the return is. Maybe we'll, we can launch uh, four half-time lead generation teams into four different markets, see where the, uh, the best hit rate is. And then over three to six months, focus our efforts down on two or three leading markets and, and really invest in those markets for growth. So the, I think the point is, is to do that research, um, you know, look internally what's happening, make a, a really good plan and build your team around that plan and then launch the effort and then really manage your KPIs moving forward. Um, it, KPIs don't necessarily have to be revenue. They can be um, how many SQLs are we are we de delivering, and, and how well are those SQLs delivering to opportunities and proposals, et cetera? So there's a lot of um, earlier milestones to to manage before you actually get revenue to see which markets are working well. Thank you so much, Rick and Diane. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. Thank you, audience. I love when we get lots of questions. I'm going to go with the middle one first. Uh, someone said, how much does the fiscality, which I think actually means wink, wink taxation at times in different countries and the currency of a country condition, the choice in setting a headquarters in reference to reception of the country market, like it could be London, Dublin's a new hot spot because it's still in the EU, Luxembourg, which, you know, maybe is a tax haven sometimes, Berlin for Europe things like that, how does that factor in? I'll let it free for all whoever wants to talk first. Yeah, I can talk to that because um, it's something that our clients ask us all the time. It's something that we're specialists in because we've set up, as I mentioned, 72 countries on behalf of our clients. So if you think about what it is that we offer at Globalization Partners, it's so that companies can move into any country that they want pretty seamlessly um, through compliance of legal, tax, et cetera, challenges that often um, many companies run into when they say, oh, we want to be in this particular country. So our customers predominantly are outside of UK. I mean, we have a, a couple hundred in the UK. We have a couple hundred in um, Canada on behalf of our customers, but really we're spread out all across the world. And a lot of very similar to what Rick has been talking about and I've been talking about, as you start to decide where you want to be, and initially you're looking at sort of going into stepping into these various different countries to see if your products and services serve that market. Behind the scenes, you're also looking at, well, if I do want to set up a headquarters, if I do want to have one place, it's uh, very similar to what I was talking about where we decided to set up our offices in Ireland for sales and marketing. Um, why did we pick that? Because we researched many different countries and decided both from a tax perspective, compliance perspective, ease of doing business perspective, part of the EU, that it really was the best place for us to have our headquarters. Similarly, we looked at many different locations in Asia and settled on Singapore. It was very centrally located. It's very agnostic. It's a perfect location for, again, branching out and still having people in various different countries. But it does definitely, when you look at something like headquarters, it's different than putting in and starting markets with a few salespeople or, or a few whatever um, finance people, or maybe you want to have developers 
whatever the case may be. With uh, globalization partners, one thing that happens that's quite different is we take on all the burden. So you select the candidate and then we help you to go into that market. Initially, maybe it's one or two people and then over time it grows or you go into other countries. So hopefully that did answer the question. U.S. companies, there's another question on U.S. companies with the U.K. Yeah, U.S. and U.K. is just one example. Um, it, it can be U.S. to any country. A lot of times it would be to go to Germany to be part of the EU, or it could be uh, France or Spain or, again, anywhere in the world. Um, it just depends on, again, looking at, uh, going back to Rick, the data, and really where has your product or service served well so far? What are the indicators that you're starting to see? So hopefully that answered the question. And if it didn't, please um, have a follow on to that one. Whoever asked that question, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. For the uh, I think if we were deciding on something, I think uh, we all agree that starting out a bit flexibly, testing out the market, don't build a headquarters by default. Well, some do have the kind of money, but if you're not a FANG company, it's best to hire one or two people that could easily work remotely and on site with your company. Uh, Rick, we have another question from the audience I'd like to shoot to you. Uh, someone says, thank you for this great session. Thank you for the feedback. Please give us a good review at the end. And Rick, can you please elaborate on a success the success rate on US companies going to Europe and they're specific, not the UK? So they're talking about mainland Europe more. So yeah, I, I don't, yeah I don't think there's a, a big difference in success rate between one or the other. I mean, you, Europe is, uh, the UK is, is another country in, in Europe and many people decide to, to launch their first for, for different reasons. But if you decide to launch in, in France or, or Germany, um, the success rate, uh, I, I don't think there's a, a big difference. I mean, Germany, for example, is the biggest market in Europe. It's the hardest market to crack. It'll take you the longest to, to get your first business. And so it takes a, a lot of patience. Uh, it can take a year to two years, but they're very loyal customers and they're, they're very big, um, strong companies. So if you, if you have the staying power and you have the budget to invest a good year in the sales process, Germany is an excellent market. But if you want a quick win um, and you're an English friendly company, then maybe the Benelux or the Nordics, which are smaller markets, so there's not going to have as much um, revenue potential in the long term, but it might get you those quicker wins to kind of get your foothold in Europe, learn the local market, and, and then expand from there. Um, you know, what are actual success rates? I mean, if you look at most startups, what one in a hundred startups make it. So, you know, we, we talk to kind of scale ups. Um, some of them are not successful because they just really weren't ready for the market. Um, but I would say um, at least a third are very successful uh, and a third I would say are, are moderately successful um, and, and maybe 10, 20% are, are, are not successful. Um, and, and the reasons for not being successful is, is typically around funding or, or just being prepared or maybe trying to take on too much too, too early and not being focused enough. Um, so there's, there's different reasons. Um, and, and I will just touch on the other question as well about, about the headquarters. Um, if you're if you're using our approach, or if you're using using globalization partners approach, you you can really hold that decision for a year or two. Um, you can do the planning. You can build teams in in, in Europe. Um, maybe you call London your headquarters, and, and and you have one general manager there, but you have a support team in Ireland. But you know you don't have to decide where that HQ is going to be until a year or two goes in to it and you get revenue from, from the markets and you see which markets produce the best. And then you might want to then build your team around where your clients are. If it's a service, um, uh, if you're, if it's a service that you're offering and it can be based in, in, in Dublin or Galway, that that's fantastic. But if it's something that you're going to be need to be closer to your clients, uh, let's say it's a, it's a banking solution, um, and you find a good foothold in, in, in France or in Switzerland, um, maybe that could be a good place for, for your future headquarters. So, you know, think about it a bit about the more you can delay some of those, those decisions of incorporating in, in the tax burden um, and wait, you know, get into Europe from a commercial perspective first, 
learn the market. And then once you have some momentum in the market, then make a decision on, on where to kind of build that HQ. And then I would say probably one in six companies they're saying may not build another HQ because if you're using, you could use a company like Globalization Partners for an employer of record to have or have Salesforce Europe people there. You may not need to go through the entire extraneous process of setting up headquarters because the world's global and they're saying one out of six companies, especially when we're talking the tech space, may not have these offices anymore and that's okay. So it's good to Anyway, in these uncertain times, I think we would all say it's probably better to wait. And then just something that I thought was really interesting, I was thinking about, and this is kind of anecdotal, but I've worked on quite a few SaaS teams now. But while everybody's targeting the bigger markets like the UK, France, Spain, and especially Germany, I have found just this anecdotally again, but the conversion rate from demo or trial to a paid product in the Netherlands and then even though we're not talking about this part of the world, Australia and New Zealand to be about 50%. So while the Netherlands is a tiny little country, I think it's like 3 million people. I've seen just again, anecdotally, but like some really interesting conversion rates. So don't always think you have to go for the biggest because maybe you can be the biggest company in a small country. So it's definitely about being flexible and just reading that data like everyone keeps saying. So Diane, well, both Diane and Rick know this, but I, usually the first employee to set up in a new country when you're talking about going abroad is most likely a sales representative, maybe a sales manager. So what's the advantages of hiring someone that's very local and somebody that's already there so you have it localized and having that local presence already there instead of you know, moving someone from the U.S. or the U.K. to another part of the world? Who Did you want? Who, you who, you, who, who do you want to go, Jennifer? Oh, I love the politeness, Diane. You can go first. Please, so nice. please. <laughs> no, I mean it's very common for when I look at our customer base, and of course Rick knows this with your company, Rick. I mean, um, sales is typically the very first set of people that are going into a country, depending. And uh, like I said, with our company, what we see is. We typically will will have a customer reach out to us. They have a need. They want to go into a country. Um, they'll contract with us um, as an employer of record. They'll hire someone and we'll put them on our payroll for the first country. And then next thing you know, all of a sudden they're saying, wow, that was wildly successful. I want to do that in 10 more countries. The localization is so important. Um, people like to buy in local languages from each other. They like to know that you understand the customs and things like that. The expat works well when you are setting up a headquarters and you want to get some of the culture coming from the home company, company and home country into that new country. But um, for the most part, that's one person. The rest of the people will end up being from that local country. So for instance, I mentioned Galway. We went there last year. We started, we hired our entire marketing team in Galway. We brought one expat over who happens to also be an EU citizen, brought her over to run sales. I did hire someone in the UK okay, as well. well. And, and our, our chief, chief technology, technology officer, officer has already, has already hired, hired 30, 30 people, on the, people on the tech side, side in Galway, in Galway and, plans and plans to another 100. 100. So, so we like we the like the local side, side of it. We, we think we that think that's, that's really important. important. Based on the based fact, on that, the we're fact that we're working in 180, 180, 187 countries, countries on behalf on behalf of our clients, we're hiring we're hiring those kind of kind of people. They're finding, they're finding talent. talent. We're, we're hiring, hiring them for them. them. In the, in the respective, respective countries, countries to, do to do the business, business again, again in the, in local, the local customs, customs in, the in the local type, type of tradition that would, that would happen, would happen in, that in that country. country. Um, Rick, Rick, you, you might, might want to add to that. that. It's a good question. Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you, Diane. Um, you know, absolutely, I, I would agree with all that. And and I think it really all starts with the sales plan of of uh, from the research that you wanted to do before uh, that you that you did before. So define that sales plan and then hire per, per that sales plan. Um, and that means well-qualified people for the the service that you're 
looking that you need. And that could be lead generation or inside sales or field sales, whatever it is. So you just don't take somebody who you know or somebody who's been recommended, but what country are we going to start in? What service are we looking to deploy? Um, whether you're going to hire that person on your own or through globalization partners or through us, how do you manage those people um, and, and how do you track success? Um, and then um, local localization is, is critical. So if you want to sell in France, you need a, a native French speaker. If it's going to be lead generation and inside sales, that native French speaker could be sitting in Galway or in Dublin. They don't necessarily have to be in France if it's going to be lead generation, lead generation or inside sales. But if it's going to be enterprise sales where they're going to be meeting with the banks or the telcos or the big retailers, um, it's they really want to know that you live in the country. Um, and it's just a matter, it's kind of showing your commitment. So, so even companies like HubSpot, um, they put most of their people in, in Dublin and I believe that they struggled a bit to close the bigger enterprise sales because they're doing most of it remotely and they're doing great on the mid market, but struggling a bit on, 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 on enterprise and even salesforce.com. They put, they first put their bigger office in, in London and in Dublin. And then we're kind of late for putting offices in the rest of Europe and, and, and they, they still have, um, a heavy amount of their clients in the UK and Ireland and, and now gaining quickly in the rest of Europe. And that's because they put offices locally. Um, so it's having, showing the local commitment, speaking the local language, it's having, um, understanding the local culture. Um, every deal that you sell is going to be competitive. And if you're competing against somebody um, who's calling in remotely uh, in, a, in a different language and you're local, you're going to have a competitive advantage of, of winning those types of deals. So, um, so that's an advantage. Um, understanding GDPR, there's a question on GDPR as well uh, that, that I see. Understanding GDPR and, and, and doing that right and not messing that up is, is really important. Like you can't spam people with emails, especially in markets like Germany. You can be, have a huge fine of about 2% of, of your revenue if you do that wrong. Um, you can't be telemarketing into people's mobile phones. Um, that's against GDPR and that can be a huge fine. So, so whatever you do, it has to be done compliantly. Um, and so whether you build your own team do it thoughtfully and compliantly or as a service partner with globalization partners or with us of everything that we do is, is compliant and, and, and GDPR compliant. That's great. And thank you for picking up and weaving in those questions. And I have to thank the audience member that gave me a shout out for my debilitating poor geography, despite having lived in Europe this long, that the Netherlands has 17 million inhabitants, not 3 million. My bad, but still a smaller country that a lot of people maybe don't think of or don't think of the capacity of looking at the Benny Lux as a market. So thank you for that. So Rick, uh, since we're going to be in this limbo world for a bit now, um, and we're probably not going to be able to meet these hires in person, especially if we're hiring someone in another country, how do you remotely find the right candidate? Uh, when I was in sales, I guess like 15 years ago now, I literally had to sell the hiring manager a pencil or a bottle of water back to her. Uh, what's changed? How do you vet those candidates? How do you know if you are hiring the right salesperson in a country when you're not, maybe you've not even visited that country? So I, I go back to the sales plan, um, have it documented and agreed on where you're going to hire people and, and how you're going to hire them. Um, we, we built a team of about 100 sales professional, professionals who are active on our on our clients today. And as we sign new clients, we either source people from our existing team or we expand and we, and we bring new people on. Um, and the first um, the first way we expand is really leveraging the personal networks um, in the local countries, in the local verticals. And so, if we have a telco client in, in France and we have two full time telco account people selling into the telcos in France, and we have a new uh, um, client that is targeting the telcos, I go to my two partners and say, Who do you know who's a star performer um, who is, has some availability for, for, for client X on, on a full time or, or, or a part time basis? So the first thing that we do is we, we leverage our personal network to try to bring people in. Um, we, if, if that fails or we won't find the right person, then we do reach out via LinkedIn uh, and we try to cross-reference um, the contacts that we have with those people or the contacts that my team have with those people. 
and, and check references um, and, and, and see what their experience has been on the, um, you know, in, in the past. Um, with, we've always been a global company. We've always had people remote. So that's allowed us to, to hire people all, almost anywhere within, within Europe, which, which opens up the, uh, the, um, the portfolio of people that you can bring on the team a great deal. And that, that helps, helps a lot. Uh, when you're when you're hiring people for new tech coming into Europe, it's it's really a business development uh, uh, engagement versus sales engagement. So you're just not coming here selling a script or pitching a script and, and expecting the sales to go through. Um, these are unique business development individuals who have to be strong um, sales and and hunting. They have to be good at they have a technical background. And not just be pulling in technical support every time that they have hard questions, um, and they also need to understand the business side of things. And so it's it's really a well-rounded individual that you need to, at the beginning to to open your for um, for your clients, for clients. Um, and and lastly, we we typically don't take people that have come from a, from a big brand that have been a, been able to rely on on a big brand to open up the doors or a big brand support infrastructure to support them. Um, so many of our people uh, worked for a large enterprise in the past, but have proven themselves working for startups or a non-known brand opening Europe before for them. Um, and that's really critical that they, they have that proven experience of, of uh, opening the doors for an unheard of company, a new technology, maybe even a new service, and being able to close the business and, and grow the business. Um, so that's that's been our experience in that space. Great. And when someone's ready to hire that person, Diane, I understand Globalization Partners is kind of an alternative to setting up that arduous legal entity in a new country. Plus, also, let's be honest, we haven't even talked about this, but you kind of want to hire locally because a lot of countries' borders are shut and there are a lot of visas are not happening for new jobs. So uh, Globalization Partners is kind of an alternative to that. So can you explain how an employer record works? and its advantages and what parts of onboarding Globalization Partner does and doesn't? I sure will. <laughs> so so uh, the employer of record concept is still rather nascent in some parts of the world. I would say um, it's starting to get a little more mainstream and understood in the U.S. Um, we're doing a lot of marketing and, and a lot of work to get the word out through analysts and, and such all across the world. But it basically allows you to hire around the globe without setting up that legal entity. The EOR serves as a legal employer while you as the company manage the individual on a daily basis. Now, one thing that probably those of you who have not ventured out into setting up an entity, you just touched on a very good point, Jennifer. Um, with COVID, it is really difficult now. If you want to set up an entity in certain countries, for instance, you need to have a wet signature. So you have to travel, you have to be there, you have to be able to do that compliantly, et cetera, with a bank. Um, and with COVID, the travel restrictions have really curtailed that. Luckily, we have done all that hard work over the course of years, as I mentioned. And what an EOR does is number one, payroll. So we put the professional, that's what we call your employee, on a locally, our locally compliant payroll. The taxes, all the taxes, the tax filings, everything is done on behalf of that professional. The benefits are competitive or compliant with the country because every single country has a different set of benefits that are required from statutory standpoint. And I might add that even before COVID, some countries like Brazil, China, and a couple others would take well over a year to set up if you wanted to have an entity in that particular country. The compliance, the compliance factor uh, for having people in country is a huge piece as well. And by employer of record, we take care of that. Testing new markets, we, we both, Rick and I, have talked about that a lot throughout this talk. But testing the new markets and being able to do that e easily and finding out, well, it's, it's just not working in Greece. So we're going to move out of Greece and go to another country. I mean, that's a great way to test the product or service without a lot of all the work that it takes to set up an entity. 
the top talent, as I mentioned before, because of COVID too, the top talent situation has been huge. Being able to hire anyone anywhere for whatever positions it is that you're looking for is a very easy way to make that happen with an EOR platform. And, and the underlying point is the managing the risk. So there is very little risk in doing this, very short cost compared to setting up that compliant entity with the banking and the financial and having legal representation and all those other things that it takes to set up an entity. So it's a great alternative that many companies, as I mentioned, we have well over a thousand companies that have been working with us now over the last few years, growing at 40%. Companies are looking at this as, wow, this is a great way to move into that new market with very little headache. So that's the essence of it, Jennifer. I have to ask, are there other names it goes by or is employer of record the common term or maybe people know it as some other names that they'd be more familiar with? Yeah, well, in the US, um, PEO, so or co-employment would be some of the words that people would understand. That's not a concept that's outside the US. So it really has been that nascent type of uh, day in and day out trying to get the word out of how an employer of record can help companies. Once that happens and we break open and, and we do a lot of webinars, a lot of talks, a lot of marketing, um, companies are going, aha, what a great way to be able to move into a new country, hire someone, find that talent and be able to get them on board in a matter of hours. Because again, they sign an MSA with us and we get the employment contract done and the person is able to work for them immediately. So it doesn't really go by another name. Um, we're just trying to get the name out. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, you've spread in the word, but it, I think you're doing a pretty damn good job of it considering it sounds like people are probably finding you about how do I hire this person in this country <laughs> because it's more they're looking well, that's, for. That's right. You know, keywords, um, having those, those statements as you're Googling and being able to find us, that's key. And then once you find us, you go on the website and you go, oh my goodness, because we have a tool called Globalpedia that helps companies understand the jurisdiction of every single country that you can do business and we can do business in and understanding the local laws, vacation, leaves, you name it, um, the different types of benefits that are required, pension plans, holidays, all, all those types of things. And you just put in a country, Australia, Australia here it is, is, New Zealand, here it is, Japan, Japan Spain, you, you name it, South Africa, Africa and, and, and you, you can, can find out the details of what it takes. And again, that's not something that a company that does business with us needs to worry about because that's what we worry about. We just want you to get the talent on board quickly so that you can test the market, go about the business with them, um, as Rick said, business development, understanding if there is a market, et cetera. Absolutely. And we are starting to wind down, but um, I just wanted to say another question from the audience. To reach top international or external sales talents, what do you recommend in terms of compensations, i.e. salary plus bonus or commissions plus bonus? What is the best approach per EU country? Not a light question. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> at least one benefit when you're going with the EU country, you don't typically have to offer what the U.S. typically looks at as salary perks because typically the amount of time off or your health care is part of it already but that is certainly an interesting question and do you want to go on that one a bit oh sure i mean every single country has sort of the bar of i want a senior salesperson i want a junior salesperson i want a business development rep i want a partner manager Having hired all across Europe, every single country is different. You sort of get to understand the benchmarking of each country. But it's a typical plan of salary plus commission. And it varies. Um, we, we talk in terms of percentages. It could be 60% base salary and 40% commission. It could be 50-50. 
you know, all different mixtures. And what it costs in one country is not the same as what it costs in another. So it's just important to know that sort of what, where the bar is. And that's something that there are great companies out there that can help with that. We can help with that. I'm sure Rick knows that inside and out, what the different sort of, um, we look at it as the different tiers are. Just like we do in the U.S., every single country has that same set of tiers. And so when we've hired now in Galway, we've hired in the U.K., as I mentioned, we're in the Netherlands, um, we're in France, we're looking at people in Germany right now, in the Middle East, Israel, um, Spain, Italy, every single one of them is a little bit different, but all of them have the same thing. It's typically salary plus commission for sales. Right. Yeah, no, I, would, I guess I would... Yeah, I just gonna say the only thing I'd probably add to that is is understanding what what the revenue targets are, right? So um, if it's a uh, a field based account exec who has a million euro in, in SaaS revenue, then those salaries and those commissions need need to be need to fit your business model for 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 that compensation level. Um, you know, don't don't overpay or don't underpay. Don't think that you're going to get somebody. You know, like oh, I have a budget for fifty thousand base, and I'm going to pay him thirty thousand bonus. But I want this person to do a million euros in SaaS revenue. It's just that's that's over the bar of what you're expecting from that resource. So the clients need to be honest and clear with themselves about what the revenue targets are and and what it and what kind of a person it takes to deliver on those revenue targets. And again, that's going to be different for for every country. Um, and when we do that for our clients, we we take that responsibility. So we take the re revenue targets and we propose a, a business model of a fixed fee and a commission, and then we we manage that all the way through. Um, if you're hiring on your own or through globalization partners, then yes, you know there's um, there's assumptions in those markets, and and Europe is like the U.S. There are good salespeople and they're not good salespeople, and it's important to look at people's past track record and 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 hire well and 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 pay well, uh, because if 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 you're not paying well and 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 people see a, a better opportunity, they'll they'll take a better opportunity. So it's better to to have a the right competitive rate up front to make sure that the people you're getting on your team are, are the right people and, and sticking with you in, in, in growing that business. Because what what's hard, um, especially if, if you're hiring the first person and you don't have oversight on that person, if they go into the market and they start and they leave for any reason. Um, and you don't have close control of that person or in the pipeline that you will lose a lot of momentum in, in that market. So, um, you know, getting the right people, compensating them well, right, managing them well, right, and, and seeing those markets through to fruition, through through to revenue and revenue growth is, is really important. And then as we're winding down, and we had so many other questions, but the audience provided great questions and y'all punted them really well, bringing up different aspects, I guess. Let's just end on the note of why now? Why should people be feeling optimistic about the future and about looking to hire people and looking to expand your business? Diane, do you want to start? Yes, uh, I, I think, you know, we're going through a pandemic. We're going through tough times. Um, no question about it. I think that we have to be realistic that business does go on and that people want to be employed, people want products and services, and that there's no reason to wait unless your financials say you cannot. It's important to jump ahead and maybe it's to get a competitive edge and not to sit back and, and wait for things to change. They will change, change is inevitable, but I can tell you the customers that we brought on have not stood still, they are moving Quickly, um, we had almost 200 net new clients in Q4 alone. We had hundreds of new countries added from our existing clients. So people are not sitting still; they're still moving forward. Jennifer. Yeah, I, I would I would agree, Diane. Exactly. It, you know, there there was a bit of a freeze at the beginning of 2020 with with the virus, and then people were cutting costs. In the same, we've seen a big boom Q3 and particularly Q4 of people getting off the sidelines and getting back into the market and and, and hitting the market hard. It's 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 time to grow and 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 tech um, is doing well. T tech is 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 um, addressing a, a lot of issues in society today, and, and people are spending. and And from a sales perspective, 
it's it's almost actually easier to sell when people accept that you don't have to see them face to face. And so in the past, even if you lived on the outskirts of Paris and you needed to drive in the center of Paris for a meeting, that's that's a half a day or a full day. Now it takes an hour. So you could have six of those meetings now where before you could have two of those meetings. So it, even senior field-based account executives who are mainly working from home um, and are now working remote, but you still need that senior person with the right network and the right experience, they're just much more efficient than they were before. So we're, we, we are seeing a lot of demand and, and, and I think it's exciting. And I think a lot of people are, are realizing um, that they can work remotely, they can work remote uh, home uh, from home. And a lot of people are leaving the big cities as, as we all know and moving to smaller towns and, and saying, hey, I can, I can set up a small office in a small town and work from home. So I, I think that's gonna have an interesting impact on, on society as well. Well said, Rick. <laughs> snap, snap, that was really good. I appreciate you both taking the time to join me today. And I appreciate all the listeners. You listeners will get an email uh, with Rick and Diane's contact information. I'm sure you have more questions. I know I have more questions. Uh, we just touched the surface of how to build a quality sales team remotely and compliantly. You know, a broad one, maybe we can't get there, but there's plenty of reasons to be optimistic. And I hope everyone enjoyed this conversation and I hope you'll give it a good review on, give a good five stars on bright talk and i hope if you really enjoyed it you will continue the conversation and share it and please let us know if you have more questions thank you thank you thank you jennifer thank you diane thanks for everybody for joining thank you bye all bye, bye.